Thank you, Eli. Um, so again, I'm Nadav from uh, IUCC, uh, part of uh, an NREN part of uh, Giant, and together with uh, Giongi, we uh, that helped set up this event. Uh, we would like um, to share case studies from uh, last this last year, this last intensive year of uh, going uh, very heavily into online learning more, more than we used to in, in the last uh, several years. And with this um, high uh, intensive uh, workloads on, on our systems, on our Moodle systems, we, we started a few months back to uh, share information between ourselves, between uh, the Enrans, and uh, at, at some point we decided we need a, a more active channel to uh, rapidly uh, being, being able to exchange information in between us, and we opened a, a Telegram group, which is publicly available to everybody, and over time we saw more and more um, system administrators, ITs of uh, large model systems come, come together and, and share information, raise questions and get answers um, about the issues they uh, encounter. And after this uh, intensive last few months, we decided it's, it's now a good time um, to share a few case studies of uh, large Moodle systems, how they are managed, uh, their architecture, their challenges and solutions um, in, in a friendly uh, community uh, session. <clears throat> so thank you for, <clears throat> thank you for everybody, all speakers that uh, um, uh, accepted the invitation to share their information. And uh, as we can see here in the agenda, uh, it's quite a lot, so uh, bear with us. Of course, everything is recorded, so we can always, if you have issues that you need to uh, address and, and uh, leave, leave the session, you can always uh, see the recording later on. So I will start with the uh, introduction of uh, Martin Boziak from uh, the Slovenia, the Arnes uh, Enren, that will uh, start and present uh, their system and uh, we'll follow up with the uh, Q&A. So if you have any question, please try to put them in the chat and I will um, moderate them later on after the session. Uh, Martin, I'm giving you, let's see, uh, co-host and I think, okay. and I'll stop sharing and you can introduce yourself and, and start with the presentation. Are you ready? Just a second. Excellent. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Uh, oh, here it is. Okay. Um, I guess you see it now. Uh, yeah. Projection, projection, start. All right. Okay. I think you're seeing now these. I think I should switch. Is it okay? Like this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we see this. Okay. Um, well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Martin Božić. I am coming from Arnes, uh, from Slovenia. Um, I will, uh, well, I, I tried to figure out what to, to say and I, uh, well, it, it's been a, an exceptional year and um, so I, I wanted to share actually a story uh, apart from the architecture and the operations and it actually grew up, overgrew somewhat the, the uh, other parts. But I think the, the most important thing is uh, experience. Um, the most interesting thing is experience, not so much the um, intricacies or the configurations or the uh, whatnot. Um, also, I'm a um, Lord of the Rings inspired lately because I read it with my children, so there will be lots <laughs> of minis. <laughs> um, so, um, well, uh, Arnes provides uh, ICT services for uh, higher education and research institutions. 
in our country, as well as primary and middle schools. We belong to a Ministry of Education and, um, well, we, we're not a big country um, and some students, some pupils, um, as you see, um, and Arnes is not a big uh, um, institution. Uh, and our team is not so many big and we have to wear many hats. And uh, among those hats, I uh, wear the Moodle administration. Um, I, I, of course, during this uh, year, I became, some, um, in a way, a team lead. And um, I came here to actually assist with a previous containerized solution of um, Moodle sites that were offered to um, primary and secondary education schools. Um, such a decision was made because they were poorly maintained by the um, tech, uh, uh, by the um, administrators from schools because they have to keep up the local computers, the uh, all sorts of things, and they lack the uh, experience they uh, should have uh, about upgrading Moodle, having backups, and so on. And we already offered them WordPress service uh, as a multi-site, multi-tenant solution, and it uh, worked pretty well. And they migrated all those Joomla from those containers to WordPress. Um, and of course, we wanted to. Uh, uh, Martins? Yeah. So, um, I think uh, we all see the um, list of all the slides and, and not. Uh -huh. Okay, so I should switch like this, I guess. Just a second. Where is it? Like this? Still, still the slides. All the slides. All the slides, yeah. Maybe it's. Uh, 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 okay, I see. Uh, I, I'm doing the presentation, but uh, just a second. I uh, have to do it like this, I guess. Uh, if I can help you, uh, you have to start share again. You have to share your presentation stop screen. Oh, stop stop sharing, sharing and start a new and share your presentation screen okay. in, was... in the presentation mode. Well, it's, where is it now? Oh yeah, this one. Okay, like this, now you mm, see it, right? No, no, no. Yeah. Easier it's gonna be to share the entire screen if that helps. Entire skin, all right. Okay, oh, that will be a bit, okay, just a second. <laughs> Is it working now? Um, you're not sharing. Yeah, yeah uh, I, I'll just, um, I turned off the, the dock so I can have one screen only. Uh, and now sharing the screen um, like this. Is it working now? Uh, no, can you start the presentation maybe? Okay, so you Stop see the started. presentation. You see the presentation. Uh, yeah, now you can start presenting. It should. Oh, well, where is it now? Okay, it's somewhat locked up. Oh, oh. you see it now? Yeah. Okay, like this. Exactly. Excellent. Thank okay. You. Okay. So we 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 uh, we 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 figured out that um, having one Moodle for all the uh, um, primary and secondary schools would be good enough, um, uh, considering uh, all the other things that um, uh, have been taken into account, and. Um, so we started to migrate the Moodles. They were old Moodles, 1.9 mostly, or even some even older, some younger, but still they were very old. And we still wanted to keep their content to move on. And the migrations took a while, but they were just complete a few years ago. Um, and we were quite happy with the results. We've had now 366 institutions in them, uh, mostly primary schools, some secondary, a um, couple of faculties from the US University. But, um, and considering the numbers, we could say we were quite large, but the actual usage wasn't that big. 
but we are counted it that um, I was somewhat a gardener in a shire, not very uh, <laughs> upset by anything yet. But then came the uh, Thursday, 12th of March, and the signs were there. The government, the new government uh, started the rumors. I mean, they just switched and the, the rumors were they will go on a lockdown the whole country and just figured out we better pack up sooner than later and uh, start from working from home. And uh, we quickly figure out that virtual machines um, were not good enough and we, we cannibalized some of our equipment from the data center we could and uh, started to rebuild the service in a cluster mode. Of course, uh, I couldn't do it without my help of my colleagues. And uh, we, we didn't want to experiment with containers or moving to cloud because there were so many unknowns and we just stick to what, what we do now. Um, maybe the, the largest experiment, experiment up to till then was CentOS 8 because it was in a way quite new for us, um, but still very boring technology, you could say. Um, so, but Still, um, we've managed actually to do it in a weekend almost, but um, now we had to figure out what went wrong. And there were quite some things wrong and mostly um, simple things like um, watching up config.php um, file and um, actually managed to, to um, uh, um, Bork up sessions that still didn't go over Redis, but to NFS. So the service for the first week wasn't very running very well. But we eventually managed to get a hold of the the new environment we were in, and we 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 reached somewhat um, by by the second wave standards somewhat really big numbers. Still, uh, I, I think it was quite large even for that time. Um, and the lockdown lasted quite a lot, but still it, 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 it showed that people weren't really prepared. The schools weren't really prepared. And uh, then we started actually to prepare for the second wave. We analyzed the data we had and estimated possible bottlenecks. Um, and of course, the, the, the whole infrastructure changed and we have to, I had to tear down the, the staging environment and the development environment to accommodate for the new, new um, circumstances. Um, the, the priority was um, to, to upgrade to 3.9 because we really wanted to um, use the new SQL slave read-only feature because we identified SQL CPU as the bottleneck. Um, and the other thing we did was to um, have better user provisioning because the process was manual up till then. So user had to log in, you had to, I don't know, um, enroll it manually or they had to use um, uh, self, uh, self enrollment and so on. And of course, we ordered we ordered new and better hardware to replace the improvised setup we had. Of course, there was also education of teachers that was very, very important uh, and, and contributed greatly, I think, to the success, in a way, of the second wave. Still, when the wave came, um, it was very, very depressive. I mean, depressive. It was very stressful. Um, we had multiple issues, even though we, we thought we were prepared, we knew we, we didn't know what actually to expect and what would hit us. And uh, well, it was quite a fight, I could say, uh, mostly with this one. Um, and we, we, I mean, it's a problem. You don't really know what to look at at first. And then when you figure it out, you still have to trace it. And then you actually find that somebody already reported a bug six years ago. And, <laughs> and then, uh, okay, it's that simple. Okay. And so many experiences like that. 
Um, of course, what we sorely missed in the preparations, I think, looking back now, was the load testing. Um, we've had some experience back long ago, but still, we, we have no necessity for it, but now we did. And uh, we, we, we learned it long in, in a week, what to do, at least to have some estimates, but we had to do it in production. We, didn't, we, we couldn't do another same environment for the, um, just for load testing. And, and still, I think it's really, really hard to, to have some um, good estimates from, from any, uh, any load testing. Um, but that's our experience so far. Then the um, DDoS. Um, the DDoS came along with all the other trouble we had. And um, we essentially, eventually, I mean, in a couple of days said, okay, we have to implement Cloudflare because we, we have and nothing else to, 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 to stand up against. Um, uh, so we, we fixed it down and actually locked it quite well um, to, to enable only Slovenian traffic to roll in, basically. Um, still, we use it up to till today, and um, we're actually quite satisfied with it. Um, so the service was now stable, but there was, of course, a, um, a victim of uh, success. Uh, we've began to run out of space because the um, image uploads that stu students or uh, pupils were making with the, with the assignments were enormous. Uh, so we had to reconfigure the RAID array to just to make space available. And we, uh, we, were, we were still waiting for the NetApp server to, to arrive. And we actually managed it to implement it just a couple of weeks ago when we are finally have enough space for the future. Um, well, um, so the winter and fall or fall and winter lockdown lasted about two months, even more. Uh, and it was really, I think, quite um, eventful, stressful and uh, leading up to a lot of experience. And still, I think we're we were just we we're still clearing up some mistakes we've made along the way um but here are the numbers from the latest shorter lockdown and they are about the same as we have had in in the winter lockdown um well the growth is enormous and uh, i think we're we're um still learning what, what was misunderstood, misconfigured, um, misused, I think, too. Uh, for example, um, we figured out we just have to um, exclude calendar block because the, the trashing on the database just to get out all the events for every user is, is enormous and people like calendar blocks, so you better not give them. Um, and we still manage to have quite good response time. This response time is actually a consequence of uh, 1.5 seconds is a consequence of trouble with uh, Moodle event table. Uh, we have about, I think, um, 400 milliseconds um, average response time. It's actually much better than uh, VMs. That's why we've opted for bare metal. Uh, so the architecture. Um, we use nine bare metal web frontends behind Cloudflare. Uh, we have uh, SQL server and in two SQL servers in master slave setup. Uh, now we use newly fresh NetApp NFS server, but before that it was a same server as um, uh, web frontend. It was not very um, not much of a blocker, I mean, uh, of a bottleneck. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there are various VMs that we repurposed for um, cron job tasks and so on. Um, well, um, the Redis we use actually, um, we've set up it 
we set it up on the same server as database and we uh, then opted for local uh, parts of um, universal cache to to host on web front ends so it's better shared because the the central redis became a bottleneck um what else i think here are some stats about the machines we use um about development of course we we couldn't survive this without um, build system in a gitlab instance locally gitlab instance we use ansible for building uh, our um, package of or moodle and a um, uh, plugins and so on uh, so we build it up and then put it on staging servers this is set up automatically uh, while whereas production is still being uh, deployed manually uh, of course by through a heavily documented procedure because it's an orchestration now um, and um, well, um, we've managed to actually do much more deployments than before that, be before COVID era, because we had to respond to the user needs and to uh, fix bugs and to um, uh, make uh, different uh, changes. And so it was um, quite, quite, um, I think uh, well um, in place. Um, then uh, some things, some facts about monitoring. We still use mostly Nagios for alerting, but we are looking uh, into dipping our toes into Prometheus. Um, we couldn't we couldn't uh, fly our infrastructure without having good monitoring uh, from Grafana. Uh, and uh, of course, digging through um, web service logs to to pinpoint some problems. But of course, there's still um, you have to drill down into uh, PHP execution and there and SQL um, SQL queries. And that's where we use New Relic occasionally uh, on uh, just a single uh, just a single uh, web front end. And it worked, works quite well for us. Um, well, we mostly monitor uh, response time, latency, error rates, and then we we um, can drill down to single server performance or uh, single service performance. But um, in I think the, the most issues become from, um, for for example, from <laughs> cron jobs build ups and failures and uh, we're we're still missing there a couple of um couple of couple of metrics mm. um well uh, a few things about support of course the help desk bears the brunt of the support and we acted as a third level of support uh, mostly copy pasted word documents again and again uh, and they Bork up their courses, and we have to figure out where now these um, XML statements went wrong. Um, of course, there are some Moodle for all specifics that from time to time have to be explained, or sometimes we, we looked into how to we, could we fix something to, to accommodate people a bit more or have them uh, some, some features that are missing. I guess it would be mostly on on uh, management reporting, but for now it's it's not so sorely missed. Of course, then there are uh, Cloudflare limitations. Cloudflare limits, I think, up to 100 seconds for a execution, and uh, how Cloudflare business limits up to 200 um, 200 megabytes per upload. Uh, so ha we have to live with that, but uh, mostly, mostly the most of the uploads have, uh, happen between one megabyte and ten megabytes. Of course, there were 
some our misunderstandings and misconfigurations we have to we had to fix um and uh, for example real, real cron jobs that mails were not sent and so on and of course there are then um, real bugs that don't bug only us but also others in community and we we rolled up our sleeves and try to to um fix that code if possible uh we're just learning the ropes so i don't know we'll see how how this will go on um so what we have achieved well for the first first thing uh we, we managed to get through the whole ordeal uh we scaled the service beyond our wildest imaginations from actually two vms or single vm virtually we, we managed to capture a, a, a lot of um, um, users um we, we learned a ton of new stuff of course inevitably uh, we appeared in national media media uh through, through the hell hell's week uh we we also became the most google second most google google's term in 2010 behind the coronavirus um and we're very glad to um, connect with other nrms uh, in the events like this and of course the telegram group um well there are things that i, I wish we, we, we had done it differently we should have asked for help sooner um because well once you live through a, up from one experience you still don't know yet anything and um well you will be always learning and through failure and then some more but um learning is good so i guess we will um, um still have to learn a lot uh, especially about load testing <laughs> um um well I, i've let this picture here because i think now it's somewhat not ending up in shire but you've actually still two people three people managing the whole thing still wow. with help of others but uh, it, it's not as intensive as it used to be and you have to um somehow manage through all this uh, great thing that you have uh, uh to maintain it and uh to to support it it's 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 not it's not back to the shire anymore uh so um we'll see what the future brings um well what's next the things that are bothering me uh what to do with course reset cycles for the next year what to how to help people not to use up all the 52 weeks uh, uh, um, uh, um, in uh, their courses they want i don't know they use to uh, they would use 200 weeks for for, for every activity um, and of course the the courses become unusable and it's our fault i guess um, then there are dilemmas with what to do with the plugins that don't uh, move so fast as your users needs or the core itself um, how to how to handle that we don't have any experience yet with that and of course there are problems of running behind clouds there as i mentioned um actually the documentation got better i think for this year but still um, maybe some things um, could be better um, I don't know maybe we could share some we, we, we didn't manage to have time for that and um, on the other hand it's in, in clusters now I see it's it's very dependable there is no um, there is no solution that works for everyone so you're basically pretty much on your own every time i guess um and of course uh, for us i think I, I, we're missing a better cron job monitoring and troubleshooting but i don't know if that's a job for moodle to do i think we'll just um, uh, do it in in uh, our monitoring monitoring infrastructure 
Uh, well, that's it from us. Uh, thanks for sharing the burning <laughs> from um, to my colleagues and to all the uh, community from Jeant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you for sharing all this uh, exciting uh, adventure. I think you, you changed uh, Lord of the Rings for me now. <laughs> I see it now in a different perspective. I think, uh, uh, yeah, uh, when, when I was reading to my children, I, I was um, uh, thinking of my adventure too. And, and you can see it how it's, um, I think everyone that have ever done something beyond their means uh, somehow fall into this story. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great narrative. Yeah, great narrative, yes. Yeah. So uh, I saw a few questions. We don't have much time, but uh, yeah, sorry, one of the questions was, uh, how do you um, test the load balancers? Do you sorry? have something special? How, how do you test the load balancers? So they, uh, they hold the traffic. Yeah, uh, we actually, we used F5 uh, until the Cloudflare uh, came into the picture. We used load balancer from Cloudflare <laughs> that is offered by uh, Cloudflare business. I don't know if it's in the, those solutions below okay. this level. Stan, um, I see Stan is also. Yeah, I, I would like to clarify my question actually, because uh, I wanted to ask, uh, did you use any special, uh, I mean, JMeter tests uh, to test Moodle capacity after you have uh, done the scalable Moodle cluster? Yes, we, you... yeah, yes, we have in, in the Hell's Week, or j just uh, after that. And we managed to get to about uh, 18,000 users, I think we could 18,000 live users that could log in, uh, seek some uh, resource in a course and then log out. And that was about where the, the infrastructure held and, and managed to, to behave normally. Okay. And you used the uh, uh, default uh, JMeter test what Moodle can export, or did you do the test by yourself? No, no, we plan. Did, no, no, we did the test by, plan by ourselves because we wanted to um, uh, take into the account the uh, SAML login. Okay. Because um, we had also problems with the with the uh, IDPs because they didn't scale well enough or they had some bottlenecks or whatnot, and we wanted to have the whole picture. Uh, because we have only SAML login, and if they don't survive the SAML login, then no move for them. Okay, thanks. And, and we, um, we actually figured out that that was the best test plan, not to um, figure out what happens within the course, but if they survive the login, then everything else will go right along. Uh, Martin, I have uh, one more question. I'm wondering, did, you didn't really mention the, how do you handle video and all the online re recording and sessions, something like Zoom or anything similar that oh, you're using? Yeah, well, actually- Do you have a big blue button? No, we, we, um, the, the, we actually uh, built a Jitsi service uh, in the end, at the end of the uh, first wave um, uh, on our own initiative. And we integrated it into the uh, uh, Moodle through the plugin. Yeah. Uh, but also the ministry also prepared for the second wave and uh, financed the Zoom licensing. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to integrate Zoom, but, but uh, Zoom unfortunately changed the um, email policy and made it much more stricter. And we couldn't uh, have that um, work anymore because you have to have the same Edu person person name as the domain of the email. And that wasn't actually the case for us. So we couldn't integrate it anymore. But, but actually the, the teachers uh, placed the links to um, the courses and actually, we were kind of a bottleneck for the Zoom. <laughs> um, so I guess, uh, yeah, well, um, still, we, we, ha we managed to have a lot of users comparatively um, uh, through Jitsi service. Quite a lot of users use that. 
Interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so you. Uh, you can still send the direct messages to, to Martin or uh, continue the discussion specific about this uh, uh, presentation in the Telegram channel, maybe later on. And we would like to move on. Uh, so next, next on the agenda is um, Alistair Spark from um, uh, U, uh, UCL London, um, University College of London. Uh, Alistair, are you uh, ready? Yeah. Super cool. I'm going to give you a co-host. Let's see if it works. Where are you hiding? Okay, I see you. Oh, something moved. Good. So, so you can share the presentation. Everything's okay. Yeah. Good. See everything. Are you, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you perfectly. Okay. Um, yeah. So UCL. Um, is uh, sort of second slash third biggest university in the UK. Um, compete. Obviously, we've got the Open University, which everyone knows. Um, but, uh, but in terms of face-to-face -face teaching, we are um, on par with Manchester as the uh, two biggest universities in, in the UK. Um, we're, we've uh, so I joined UCL in. 2018. So I'm going to take you through a journey from from roughly then um, to put a bit of context around what we did. Um, but we're a very sort of old legacy IT approach to things, um, and thankfully changing our ways along the way. So uh, without uh, much further ado, um, yeah. So uh, we kind of went off on a. Um, um, so this was the situation where we were at, we were on Red Hat 6, um, so this is 20, 2019, and for application servers we had um, a, a master database, a slave database, but that was just used sort of as a backup and for some reporting. Obviously all the, all the data on the Moodle file store on NFS, and then a dedicated cron box to run um, to run Moodle Cron, but also run our data integration. Mm -hmm. um, we had Uniconf in there, um, and we were essentially using um, NFS-based caching, file-based file caching. Big issues with Uniconf. Um, we had six need to place issues which I won't mention uh, the way it was, which was not really proper. So we set off to, to upgrade to Rel7, um, go to see the latest Apache, PHP, get rid of Uniconf and start having an architecture which was relatively resilient between the two data centers that we have. Um, when we went live with that, we had big issues with uh, the NFS side of things and, and the caching, mm -hmm. based caching. We're pretty convinced there was something in um, in Linux itself where with um, the, the the higher version, which meant file-based caching wasn't appropriate anymore. So we we implemented Redis at that point. Um, so we already had we actually had Redis for the session store. What what version of Moodle were you using? Uh, so three seven at this okay. point. The way through this three seven. Uh, actually, no, so it was twenty nineteen. So this was three four. Ah, so twenty nineteen was three point four. Uh, the up in in this summer here, we upgraded from three four to three seven, and then we stayed on three seven until November this year. Um, yeah. So we first implemented the application caching the entire. Um, lot in one on that one. Um, no, wait. Uh, yeah, we did um, on um, 
as a, as a way to resolve this problem with NFS uh, based file based caching. Um, I think it was probably my next slide. Yeah. Um, so we implement added two servers, one on each side. Um, there was sort of a, a behind the, the scenes idea around that, which was, as I said, we got rid of Uniconf, um, and we were kind of had had the idea that Uniconf we'd rebuild Uniconf on these servers dedicated, um, properly set up because we were having issues, so many issues with it coping at scale. Um, but along the way, we um, replaced, you know, we started implementing uh, the OneDrive for business file converter mm -hmm. and then Libre Lambda. So we, in the end, kind of completely got rid of Uniconf. Um, but we still had those servers, which was very useful. So uh, we had the app caching in, in there. Um, and then obviously we hit our um, COVID-19 and the need to scale up. <laughs> yeah. So this was our initial plan, <laughs> uh, was essentially just double everything. Um, so we we went from um, essentially looking at about 2,000 concurrent users uh, in a normal September um, and the infrastructure just coping um, to actually, we want to double that. So we, we literally doubled most of the um, things. We started load testing everything um we moved the session store so we, we had the session store on the nfs server we kind of had issues with the nfs server moaning at night with a lot of our backup processes and other sorts of things so we started really moving everything on having a dedicated box for for redis um i'll stay there for a bit uh the so yeah so that, that was Probably most of March we um, focused on on that two X in preparation for the exams that we had in May. So um, obviously all the exams which would have taken place in physical exam rooms suddenly had to be done online. I think in a normal year that would have been twenty five thousand exams. Um, it was kind of brought down to eight thousand, um, and it was done in. Um, in Moodle assignments with 24 hour window to submit. So it opened at mid, uh, we had two sessions, one in the morning, which would open and one in the afternoon, which would open, uh, and then they'd have 24 hours to submit. So um, obviously we have students from around the world um, or who, who might have gone home around the world. So the 24 hour window um, allowed us wow. to. How many users? About 40. Currently, I think. Um, we're seeing we're about forty five thousand uh, FC students. Yeah. Back then, um, I know we've increased quite a lot with the pandemic, and there was a whole thing in the UK around um, the grades that you get when you leave school, and a lot more students got the grades, so we got a lot more students um, in the second year. Um, so then, we started preparing for um, for September. And the focus there wasn't just a 2x, but a 6x. Um, so, the, um, so I said we, we were doing 2,000. We were then aiming for eight, 18,000 account users uh, for, to, to handle for September. Um, so we, we, as part of that summer upgrade, we had started getting someone up and running on load testing. Um, working with a with an experienced flow tester, they'd written some scripts. We didn't really have enough time to to make extensive use of it um, for that upgrade. But now that we were going to be doing all these changes, um, that really came in handy. Uh, so that team um, member really really spent the entire year running flow tests. We, we were looking at the reports earlier. We have over 50, 50 tests. Um, run. Um, yeah, so um, so we we at that point had sort of two options in terms of how we could scale. One was sort of on prem, was one in, in the cloud. Um, we uh, had a change of CIO just around that time, so we um, uh, a new lead, new leadership. Um, was actually a lot more interested in the cloud than on-prem. Um, 
So we essentially ended up working on both things at the same time. So we had multiple streams on prem to scale up. Um, one was looking at um, web, the web, web services stream. So we wanted to get uh, to go late. We wanted HP 7.4. We were looking at Apache FPM just to try and generally make all these app servers a lot more efficient. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing that we did around caching, and actually we did that before Sam, is we, um, as we were hitting it, we, we noticed that we were maxing out the application caching on that one node. Uh -huh. um, we started implementing the localizable um, to the, within the application caching, there's different cache store mappings. Mm -hmm. Some of them can be localized on the individual app servers. So we, because we obviously had various and we started figuring out how we were going to monitor it with um, sites. And we went with adding Redis on every app server and using that as our local cache. Um, which made a massive, massive difference um, to, oh. to continue our scale up. And then still finding that we um, would max out the redders um, on that instance. So we actually had three redders um, instances for application caching. So we split up the mappings within that app server, mm -hmm. in addition to having the, the localizable ones. So we're using the open source Redis. Uh, if you use uh, Redis Enterprise or if you use um, um, the Redis in AWS or um, some, some other project that we also could look at, um, those things are multi threaded, but the open source um, Redis is, is single threaded. So, um, what version? Um, I think we want. Four, five, five. Oh, okay, four. Mm. Well, I don't think that's changed. Um, I don't think that's changed. There, there is a there is a fork of Redis which has sort of implemented that. Yeah, Redis itself hasn't, as far as I'm aware, since. Um, so yeah, so we we spent a lot of time with that. Um, so I'll move on to the next. Yeah, so we did, we then started. Um, so Redis kind of helped. Um, we were in a good place with that. And really focused on the database layer. Um, mm -hmm. So we essentially had a, a, a big master with um, the read-only node only used for reporting. Uh, so we started looking at um, uh, looking at the, the core um, Around that time, Core were looking at implementing the read-only, read-write splitting. So as that was coming online, we started making use of that and testing that. Um, um, so we started splitting the read read queries to um, to the read-only one, uh, and we were looking at something called Proxy SQL, which allows caching of MySQL queries. Uh -huh. um, one that we noticed was that we had to, I can't remember if we did it at this point or if it was because of something we'd done um, in the summer earlier. Um, there was something about the MySQL in build cache that we had to get rid of. I think, uh, no, we didn't get rid of it. It's because we were looking at MySQL 8. Um, mm -hmm. So MySQL 8 actually doesn't have the, the, the caching. The, the 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 MySQL caching. So, um, having that within Proxy SQL seemed to be providing that. Uh, we spent quite a bit of that, a bit of time in that. Um, in the end, it kind of felt like, yeah, we could have all these caching layers, but actually, all we really need is to just have more database servers. We need more read-only instances. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's really what's going to allow us to horizontally scale. Is to have just have to read of my sequel um, the you know the ram and cpu cost of the caching layer was roughly the same it felt as having more uh, read instances um, so we spent a lot of time then looking at my sequel cluster 
Um, so we use MySQL Enterprise, so eight, uh, MySQL 8 cluster, uh, which allows, so at this point, you're kind of seeing that we, we have two data centers and mm -hmm. we're, yeah. trying, we're trying to be resilient. So if one data center went down, that we can actually stay up. Uh, but there's a lot of sing single points of failures. Um, we actually had a lot of CIs of critical incidents. Um, we had four, five data center wide failures in the, in the last four. Um, so those really came into light. Um, so there was a real drive to want to make Moodle not just able to scale, but also resilient. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, by having MySQL cluster, then if one if the, the master node fails, then one of the read-only instances automatically gets promoted to being the master. And so um, so that addressed the resilience of the MySQL layer. Um, we spent a lot of time on uh, so there's a piece of software which needs to be on the application service called MySQL Router. Again, what was the name? Which essentially decide called MySQL Router. Uh oh, well, so okay. it just decides which MySQL server in the in the cluster to send the query to. Mm -hmm. So if, uh, it's got it's got uh, so it, all, it still assumes that the application will tell it which are the reads and which are the writes and which one. Um, but so you send it to specific ports, um, but then it will it will go and find the correct um, the correct master node um, and then split the, the read queries between the servers. We spent a lot of time on that one. Um, I've got to say, I never, never quite satisfied with it. I don't think Oracle were particularly clear on anyone having used it properly. Um, yeah. I think one's moving to the cloud and AWS Aurora just does it and people probably can't be bothered to spend that money um, to run something on-prem. So they that solution didn't feel like it was properly supported in a well known quantity and because we're split between data centers we have a thing where if the app server from one data center tries to talk to the base on the other data center the latency there is really really bad so we, there was a real importance that the router would send read, uh, the, the read-only query to a read to a database server within the data center mm -hmm. but it's not data center aware or latency aware so it would just it would just go across and then everything would blow up. Um, so we did a lot of testing with just more reads and that worked really well. But trying to get to the same performance as when we had stuff hard coded, we it progressively got there. I think we in it got to ninety percent, but we still had to have some hard coded bits here and there and um, and so on. So yeah, it wasn't it wasn't the best. Um, Yeah, um, I think that's the main thing around the scale up. Yeah, um, yeah we are, we're also just throwing it in there. We uh, also implemented Stack in June. Um, Do you have Stack on a different server or is it on one of the nodes? Uh, no, so it's, um, so uh, if I come back on this one, yeah, you've got the the backend nodes on the on the bottom, uh, so where the Redis and cache instances are. Um, we've got all the Docker containers, so the maximum pool is running in Docker on those uh, both on both sites, mm -hmm. um, and each of the apps are good to go and look. Um, at the um, yeah at that node within their data within their data. Tim is asking yeah. which uh, which community Docker containers do you use for stuff. Um, it's the one which is not supported anymore, from the sense of it. Um, 
It's the same one that I've seen some um, make some pull requests and Catalyst have made some pull requests. So, um, if you guys are using it, but I've definitely seen Sam make some, um, Sam Marshall make some uh, commits mm. to it. So I'm assuming. Interesting. Um, yeah. So yeah, this was our sort of crazy, crazy original sort of, this is what we should be doing. Uh, <laughs> um scaling up um we had talked about cloudflare we had to, to, talked a lot about cdns um public cdn private cdns um one of the other considerations that we had was um uh, asia so we have a lot of students who are based in in well, who, who are from china um and who would have stayed in china with the pandemic not able to travel um so we we were looking at, at how we could make our moodle better perform over there um and so cdn was the first thing that came to mind um in parallel to that there was a project from jisc which is the uk's nren um looking at uh, sort of a vpn solution with um alibaba and sort of other hmm. interesting um we we really established that the performance problem while it was slower in asia while it was slower in uh, west coast america um the performance that was existed in china just really was just it china's just that bad the, the firewall really had that that much of an impact so actually the cdn by itself would not have made much of a difference um so the vpn allows the students to, within china to connect to this thing which then takes all that traffic to some server within china and then it tunnels it all the way back to um somewhere in london and then from london it comes and connects to our servers um so it completely removes the need to have um a cdn for moodle specifically uh, and it obviously addresses the problem not just for moodle but for every single other application that we have for ecl um so that was that went live extremely expensive uh nothing <laughs> like the cd yeah um, like insanely expensive um so it's probably more than moodle's cost on but on a monthly basis well not cheap um so so yeah that's um are you getting attacked like ddos or something which is even probably more expensive. Um, we we've seen one over Christmas. Yeah. Um, it felt like a test. Mm. It felt like it was um, someone was testing the waters just before we had exams coming up in in January. Mm -hmm. um, so we kind of thought it was someone testing the waters for this, this the, disturbing the. Um, the, the the exam period um so we rushed literally within a week we implemented something um the, the next slide will be us saying we actually removed the cloud in the end. Uh, we implemented a shield uh, well aws shield is already um, enabled by default but it's shield advanced um, so we enabled that um and we are looking to in, enable cloudflare um, so we're probably going to. That's very expensive. Well, so Cloudflare, um, so, well, they're both roughly the same price, um, especially as we're looking at an entire uh, institution license. But Cloudflare allows us to use multiple clouds. So whether we're using AWS or Azure or on-prem, we've got the ability to use one product license for the entire university. Um, whether it's obviously AWS Shield only applies to um, AWS. Okay. Well. Wow. Then we we ended up moving to the cloud. So uh, I had this this one slide of what's actually still on prem, which is like these two servers here, and everything else is gone. Um, and this is probably very vague, but um, um, but yeah, we've moved to uh, uh, AWS um, in. August. Um, 
So we uh, went with Catalyst. Um, so we were both doing the on-prem scale up and, and, and the cloud preparation for the migration at the same time. Um, it's it's worked brilliantly. Uh, we've load tested it to the eighteen thousand concurrent users. We even went up to sync forty five, and it just it was just ticking along with no forty five thousand, and it was just ticking along absolutely no problem. Um, really good performance under that crazy load. Uh, we, we 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 have a good four or five servers that we were running load tests from. Um, so uh, good load generation. Um, we have a full. I should have said earlier on prem we we our production we have a full copy uh, of pre production mm -hmm. load testing on so so we had a lot of uh, capacity there sweet but yeah so with with that the we had obviously our really weird data integration um so we have a vpn link between our on prem data centers and the aws infrastructure which allows us to continue using ldap to log in so if people so, you know, Moodle's built in LDAP, uh -huh. goes over the VPN, it comes back into the data center. And our data integration has a, a joint database with Moodle and using views and store procedures and all these things um, and needs to be co-located on the same server as the Moodle database. So um, we've got the code and what running on-prem, connecting to SITs and seamless, and so our data uh, some records. And then going to the cloud so that's worked okay found the vpn connection has been quite flaky um whether it's aws automatically patching things or this something with our firewalls terminating it we're not quite sure but it has been quite flaky so alerting with cloudwatch has been really helpful mm -hmm. um but yeah um, um Yeah, so um, what else? Should we, um, uh, yeah, so that's the cloud. So we we as a, we got to to the summer uh, to mid June. Um, we were in the cloud. We continued finishing some of that work with the on prem stuff that because we thought it might be useful to other services within UCL. Um, but then we really shifted our focus on delivering new plugins for Moodle. Um, obviously, with the whole shift to online, there was all sorts of needs that were identified between April and and June um, that were going to be needed for the new academic year. So we then completely um, changed the focus from pure infrastructure to plugin reviews, LTI mm -hmm. integration reviews, um, and that lasted um, until yeah, until well, I guess until just before Easter now. Um, we then, because we were, so when we did this cloud migration, we were just really focused on lift and shift, just literally copy the code and don't touch anything of it, just move it to the cloud. Um, so we didn't do an upgrade in the summer and we did our upgrade in, in November um, to 3.9. And uh, that went to smooth, uh, but it's first first time doing it middle of an academic year. Um, and yeah, so we had through this, we were three, four, three slash four uh, more ops infrastructure people. We're, we're now moving to being a, a proper agile setup with both learning technologists and ops people together. Mm -hmm. Soon to add um, devs proper. We do have one who started last week back with us, um, but we, we're uh, adding another two hopefully in the summer. So we'll have learning technologists, developers, and ops all working together. Um, but we so yeah, despite the fact it's in the cloud and it's managed by um, a UCL, um, sorry, a middle partner, uh, we still fully own our code base, um, which is why we were able to do the the three nine upgrade mid year uh, because we've essentially been testing it and uh, so on since since May. Since three nine was released, um, so yeah, I probably have some. I'm not sure how much time I have left, but um, amazing. Um, maybe uh, maybe we have a few um, more minutes for questions. Anybody? No. 
Okay. Um, so um, maybe one uh, one question for me. Um, yep. Do you customize? Uh, how how heavily do you customize the core model for to, to uh, adapt it to your needs, or like how how is it affecting the upgrading and everything? Ah, yeah. See, also, there's one question in a, in a chat from earlier. Uh, were you uh, referring to query cache when uh, talking about caching in the MySQL? Yes. Ah, okay. The query cache. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, customizations. We have about hundred odd plugins. Wow. In our, uh, our Moodle. Um, one of the first things I did back in sort of early 2018 uh, when I started that most of the code was being FTP'd onto the servers. Um, uh, an update would take like three months to do because it's sort of, you know, unpicking all of the customizations which weren't really documented that well. Um, so we, everything we got into Git. Um, we I had this sort of build process I've been using in my, um, I've been kind of coming up with in my previous job, which I kind of Decided everyone to use. Um, um, so we're always seeking the latest version of all of the plugins that we use every time uh -huh. we do a release every two months. Uh, so we're updating the point release on all of the plugins every time, running the bugs and fixing it, changing branches, whatever's needed every release. Uh, uh, so in terms of core core Moodle, we have six or seven. Organizations. They're very self-contained, very small, uh, well-documented, well-testable. Um, we've added a few more since our 3.9 upgrade around some tooling that Catalyst has developed for us um, for instrumenting certain bug bugs that we're looking into. Um, but yeah, we're very careful about what we add uh, into core. Excellent. Well, interesting. Very interesting. Okay, Asha, thank you. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting, uh, beautiful uh, description of your system and the migration to Amazon. Uh, it's probably inspiring many people here in the chat. <laughs> and maybe you'll get some questions privately later on. Um, yeah, we, that, that, the cloud migration is probably, I didn't go into much detail, but we did make a decision sometime in April and went live in August, including doing an entire procurement process um which i think <laughs> heard of. <clears throat> putting putting money aside is, is it does it feel more easier to manage now that it is in amazon i think i think the infrastructure just works and we don't have to worry about it and it's allowed yeah. as an institution to stop thinking about are we uh, keep scaling because that's essentially what we've been doing for the last 15 years is uh, 10 years of Moodle is that UCL keeps getting bigger and we keep it, it's been scaling Moodle every single year for 10 years and then the functionality of Moodle doesn't really get looked at so we're catching up with implementing global search we're probably going to look at the Moodle map app next year um, but all of these things just haven't had the attention because it's always been infrastructure infrastructure and so the team at UCL is now able to really focus on the on the functionality and that, that's a big, big change, big, big. Yeah, win. amazing, amazing. Wow. Okay, thank you very much again, and we'll we'll move we we'll move the agenda on and and um, let's see. Next on the agenda is um, uh, Michael Spa from from the U.S. Uh, State University of Idaho. Uh, Michael, are, are you on? Are you ready? Are you with us? It's a think challenging hours for for us to be on with us here in the eu let's see let's see michael here mm. uh, a little bit challenging i don't see michael here with the with the speakers um so maybe we move on a little bit and, and maybe catch with Michael later on when he can join the conversation. 
Um, let's see. Um, okay, so I want to share um, a presentation I got from. Um, just a minute. Yeah, found it. Okay, so I'm 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 jumping I'm jumping to the next thing on the agenda, uh, which is the um, Agora project. It's a Catalonian from Spain, um, from the X X Tech um, Enran, um, but. Unfortunately, uh, they were unable to also um, find a speaker for the uh, presentation and for the project. So they send um, they send us only the presentation, uh, which I think was also presented in one of the uh, Moodle moods, previous Moodle moods. Uh, it's a huge um, project of a very large Moodle cluster to uh, support all the education, the K-12, I think, education uh, system uh, in Catalonia. And I will not go into details, just uh, show you that we have the presentation and um, I will probably get the video from that presentation very soon and add it to the agenda when the uh, webinar session is, is finished and you can see it also. I decided to, share it a little bit with you because I think it's very interesting uh, solution. Um, and I'm just running through the slides so you, you get to see what you're getting. And these are uh, two of the developers or um, maintainers IT that uh, uh, were in the core of this uh, solution. So just, just to let you know, this is this one. And Okay, let me just stop sharing and see. Um, so we are ahead of time, uh, surprisingly, and maybe maybe we can uh, reshuffle the presentations. And is is Edward um, Serco? Serco is here with us. Yes, no, Edward. Yes, are, are you are you uh, maybe ready to get your presentation on? Yeah, no problem. The break. Mm -hmm. Okay, beautiful. So, um, do, do you need uh, me to give you co-host, or can you just share? Well, you need to share my screen. Yeah. Okay. Let's see, just preparing everything. So, so Eduardo is from uh, Moodle, Moodle HU, and he will um, give a presentation of the Moodle.org um, infrastructure and, and let me prepare a bit on and top of uh, Kubernetes. Yeah. <coughs> well, after seeing uh, these uh, huge installations, uh, <laughs> is a really small site, but I think it could be interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we did actually um, pick up different type of uh, infrastructures, so mm -hmm. people will get a different perspective uh, on how, how to handle large-scale models, so uh, I'm sure each one has a different angle. <laughs> yeah, yes. That is interesting. To share. Okay, here it is. Can you see? Yeah, yeah, perfect. And we hear you very good. Okay, thanks. Let's start it. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Eduard Cercos from Middle HQ. I'm currently based in Barcelona. 
and we'll share with you our experience running uh, not such a huge site, but a relatively, relatively uh, huge uh, insta mobile installation in Kubernetes. First of all, I wish to thank Paul Gridanus, who was uh, for a former ICT sysadmin in Moodle HQ, doing an incredible job setting up all this Kubernetes infrastructure five years ago. Yeah. In, me in this amazing world, <laughs> a new a new world. And also we we'll wish to thank David Mudrak, who's a senior developer in Middle HQ. He is uh, uh, endless, his endless effort improving the site code and uh, always uh, being uh, helpful when a performance problem arises is being a uh, determinant for this success story. So, uh, well, where we came from. Uh, Factable.org uh, was a really single, uh, simple site. Uh, it was set up as a standalone ser ser Moodle site uh, in a dedicated server. No, uh, um, no MySQL servers, no database servers uh, out there. And for a long, long time, it was enough, but uh, it was uh, clear that uh, in 2018, some steps were needs to be taken for improve the service. Improve the service. At the beginning of 2020, Moodle.org was running in a two-layer classic deployment with Apache, PHP, MySQL external server, and also all the data in an in external installation and yes preparing for uh, uh, future improvements. When uh, lately we moved to AWS, the NFS became an EFS, uh, still is being used. Uh, we accept this performance. Uh, we are not uh, doing a huge uh, use of uh, files. <coughs> we added a lot per balancer in front for future horizontal scaling and so a year and a half, we started, a year and a half ago, we started experiencing some performance issues uh, because of our uh, architecture, the Apache hangs, response time was real high. Uh, it had been enough for a long time, but uh, we need to increase this, uh, the increases to such, sorry, uh, the increases to such and the continuous forums growing for us to make the final decision, the final decision. Uh, currently we have uh, over 3 million users, not concurrent users, of course. <laughs> we have 600 forums and uh, over an, uh, a million and a half posts over there. Uh, well, we all know what happens uh, last year and it was, um, a really boom, a really blew up. Every, everything was uh, rising, uh, times, uh, responses, users. So uh, the situation was uh, impossible and we needed to move uh, as, as urgent as possible. Fortunately, we were prepared. We had this Kubernetes cluster, uh, uh, I said before, and we were using it for all of our sites, uh, for learn.mural.org, lang, stats, archive, demo sites, uh, and other internal sites we use uh, daily in our work, uh, daily work basis, except mural.org. The first attempt uh, uh, was uh, done uh, almost in the beginning of this cluster, or the Kubernetes cluster, and uh, it failed. It wasn't um, well prepared. The, the, the migration was well, 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 so well prepared because uh, it was trying to move the, the, the same uh, philosophy that the standalone server, all the things in the same pot, and it wasn't uh, enough to, to run properly. Um, this uh, Kubernetes cluster we had, uh, we have, well, really we had because we migrated to ETS 
but I will take it, uh, go to it later. Uh, th this control plane was uh, had a high availability with a master and intensity cluster uh, with uh, continuously backups. We had uh, nine identical nodes distributed in different availability zones. All the infrastructure was deployed as infrastructure as a code. So we have our scripts in Terraform and Salt using to uh, deploy the infrastructure. And uh, the critical services were uh, in high ability using um, Kubernetes resources and Amazon resources. So well, it's a simplified scheme of what is this. Uh, is uh, still running in Amazon AWS in the same region. We are using all in the same region because some um, some usage is really uh, would be really uh, painful if we have in different regions. Um, we are using the three availability zones available. The scalability can be achieved with a simple script execution, so we can. Uh, uh, split out um, or uh, rise out more more uh, nodes as we need it. <clears throat> and the ability of the services is performed by the Kubernetes control plane. Uh, in case if a node fail, if there is a node failure, uh, all the Kubernetes uh, control plane moves the pods to other, other available, available nodes. Uh, it will be a no, no downtime, or if the boat's using uh, local uh, volumes, it will be a short downtime while these volumes are detached and attached to the new node. Uh, we are using external resources of the, from the cluster, like uh, the RDS databases and the load balancers in front. Uh, we have uh, extra security layers, you, you, you said, uh, we also use in Cloudflare, so uh, we have an extra security layer there. And uh, uh, well, this database with a master space uh, configuration and all the storage resources in the um, Kubernetes clusters comes from the EFS and also from the EBS, that is the local volumes I said before, where it is needed. So uh, going a bit more detail with Kubernetes, uh, just an introduction because I, I, I know this is a really extensive uh, item. Um, <clears throat> if you don't know it or you, you are not playing with it uh, uh, still now, Kubernetes is a powerful container orchestration system. Uh, keep your application in, in the desired state. Pods, what I said, pods are the, at the atomic unit of an application. <clears throat> and the way the services, deployments, that uh, daemon sets, uh, ingresses, connects with pods, define the way your application will work. To make this run, a Kubernetes cluster needs a control plane, which is responsible for all the orchestration jobs, one or more nodes that run the containers that do the real workload, uh, connects this its traffic using the Kube, Kube proxy uh, features. Um, another interesting thing that Kubernetes uh, has is the easy cloud connection, whatever provider you have. So if you are uh, running it uh, internally connected with your cloud provider. Uh, you only need to say in a script, I need a load balancer and it will get deployed for you. To manage the workload, uh, Kubernetes have several tools. At the end, these tools creates deletes, modified pods in different ways. Any of those, deployment, replica set, stateful set, daemon set, job, current job at the end, or are responsible of creating a working pod. Uh, in this graphic, you can see there is uh, one uh, to end replicas managed by a deployment. <clears throat> this uh, deployment also connects with its storage, restart it, add replicas, check its readiness using probes, 
check if the user resources are below the limits, etc. Uh, the pods can have more than one container. Uh, that's really interesting. Uh, if you need to add an extra service in your pod, you just need to create a, a, a change the deployment and add the, contain, the needed container inside. Uh, the most important thing, pods are ephemeral. So to make data persistence or share it, we need to mount external volumes. Uh, well, you know that if you are working with containers, this is the, the way. So now we have a running pod, uh, but uh, we want to use it from the outside. You need, we need to connect, connect them uh, um, using uh, some uh, ingress objects. Um, um, all these uh, things uh, um, use uh, a kind of uh, abstra networking abstraction. Uh, it's not so far easy to understand, but uh, I think it's not uh, completely needed to 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 know the details. Uh, just uh, services are going are the key part of this uh, networking, and these are going to do the the connection efficiently. They create an endpoint. The services create an endpoint for bots sharing the same app. app application. This application is defined with a bubble and let the ingress objects connect with them so clients traffic can go inside. Also they create connection points to uh, other ports that need uh, interconnection. That uh, The thing is uh, the container inside the port can, uh, can connect uh, without no extra job but if you have so, uh, pods running in different uh, we are we have the different pods running in the same pod, in the same node or in different nodes uh, they will uh, not connect unless you have some service uh, to expose them uh, for example you can see uh, uh, for example we, we connect our php pods with the ready service using this approach and then you can change anything uh, under that service. You only need to keep the, the name. So now we know uh, some details of Kubernetes, a uh, really few, and I, I'm really running for, for that. Uh, let's see some details of our instance. Install, sorry. We took our external Moodle and split it into different services. Uh, the engine's PHP uh, uh, for one side, current service for another side, Redis cache from the MUC, the session Redis, and uh, keeping our space aside, the database and the shared storage. We had some experience in coming from learn.google.org, which was set up some time ago and worked very, very well for our uh, massive courses, where these are not huge courses, of course, but um, uh, this uh, gives us the, the enough experience to, to move Moodle.org. Although it such is more like a standard Moodle site, uh, that, that means um, we have learning activities there, uh, we are running the, the usual uh, learning experience, and Moodle.org is a, um, a special case. It is not uh, we have some courses inside, of course, but the learning activities are really few in this case. Uh, so we have a certain confidence to face the migration of Moodle.org. And here is some of the configuration we had. Uh, we defined a couple of deployments, the main Moodle.org with handles, which handles all the incoming traffic and interaction with clients. Um, uses three replicas, three pods, with a single container inside uh, that has a prepared Docker image. I will show it later. The same image is used to cron deployment, which only launches one replica and handles all the cron jobs. 
To have the maximum resources available, we set the model arc replicas to run in different nodes using the affinity property. Using this affinity, we define in which nodes the pod should run and the node, the node affinity, and we prevent to deploy two pods in the same node with the pod and the affinity attribute. The node affinity is very useful to run, uh, to force to, uh, the pods run in the same availability zone, preventing to spread and reduce the interzone bandwidth cost, which really can, can be really, really high. We know it reduces the high ability, of course, because we are working in the same data center. But because of the high traffic between Moodle and the cache services, we opt out for that configuration. We prepared two different deployments for the different ready services. Both use an official Redis Docker image. So we just set up the resources and let them uh, to go. Uh, the request section that you can see there, talks about how many free amount of memory or CPU the node may have to let, they, they may have to let upon a pot run in it. The limit section is super important and let keep the, the container under some values. The CPU is not a real hard limit. Uh, this is a feature from Kubernetes itself. It uh, just reduce the process purity when it's asking for more CPU. The memory limit uh, uh, instead is a hard limit. So if a container hits this value, the Kubernetes controller just kill it and uh, uh, mm, with an out of memory error and the deployment uh, deploys a new, uh, a fresh new one. In some cases, this is a good thing. Uh, for example, we, we, uh, we had this help with Redis. Uh, so, um, we keep the memory under control. If we need to refresh all the Redis memory, we only need to restart the, the container. It can be dangerous uh, in some situations. Uh, in, the, in fact, if you kill a container in the middle of a job, so use it wisely. And so far, is here is our installation. <clears throat> uh, we have the cron deployment with one replica running all the cron jobs and tasks. The engine's deployment with three replicas handling the client's requests connected to the Redis cache and the session Redis using the corresponding services. And a couple of external resources that are the database and the storage. The services uh, create the endpoint for the running pods. Uh, um, so we only need three because the cron uh, is not using service, it not needs to connect to anything. Um, <clears throat> it works. Uh, 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 the cron pod works uh, internally, so don't need to connect to outside. The key point for services is the selector property, where uh, we define the level the pods may have to be used in these services. In this case, we are saying that all the traffic to port 80, TCP, name it HTTP, will be forwarded to the port 80, 80 of a running pod with the level APP equals to Moodle-R. No more network configuration, so it's, quite, it's a kind of magic. <laughs> In order to have the connection from outside, we use an ingress object that routes the HTTP traffic with some simple rules. In this case, all the traffic with a host header equal to Moodle.org will be routed to a service named Moodle-org through the port 80. As you can see at the end, there is a part of a path option which can restrict the rules to specific path and backends. In this case, all the traffic is routed to the same backend, but we can set up a specific path to be forwarded to another service. This is, uh, this is a really interesting Kubernetes feature. Uh, we are still working in, on it, uh, but uh, we are using it actively in, our, in some parts of our installation. 
but uh, had some options to self-healing. That means uh, if there is, uh, uh, that means uh, we check continuously inside the pot if the container is alive, if it's ready, or if has uh, if has started properly. In each case, Kubernetes can decide what to do. Uh, currently, we are using the liveness proof in the state side stats dot So if the container doesn't respond in less doesn't respond in less than five, five seconds on the port uh, 9821, three times in 60 seconds, the container will be restarted. We only need one success to reset the probe and it will start checking after 30 seconds after startup. We're probably going to use it in Moodle.org, but I still haven't had a situation where this life liveness proof became absolutely necessary. So that's, that's the reason why we are not using it. Um, the readiness proof instead looks promising because it will put the failing pot or the starting pot out of the service, off the service, uh, and will see. Uh, so it will not be receiving the request. We will not have. Uh, but gateways uh, responses or gateways timeouts, uh, and then will be put on the on service once it the, the once the prof check it okay. Uh, so uh, it real works. It works. Uh, uh, in fact, the, the we set all this thing up just at the beginning of the rising. Uh, we um, as. Martin said at the beginning about uh, the, the load, load testing, it was the key feature in this case. Uh, we had some, we made some uh, quick uh, load testing with Jotometer to uh, mainly be, uh, to check if we were uh, having a similar response between the classical deployment and the new deployment. Uh, once it check it okay, test it okay, we go ahead and fortunately we do it. We did it because uh, the the traffic was so so high that uh, we uh, couldn't afford this situation in the old installation. Um, and as you can see at the, at the t uh, on the tails of the, of the graphics. <clears throat> The situation now that is uh, more similar to the, the similar to the pre-COVID situation, we already we already have we are having a huge um, traffic uh, requests, but the times are uh, not not similar but better better. We are on, you can see on the tails uh, this year the early, early this year the load time, that means the time that a browser takes to uh, load the full page are slightly uh, similar. It's uh, not, not, not our fault. There are some things that are outside this, this outside, uh, are out from our site. Uh, and you can see that the response time is really, really uh, good. We are we're talking about milliseconds, that's right, but you can see that uh, this is a bit more uh, stable, stable and, and fear, fear low, uh, feel lower than it was. Yes, just uh, for a, <clears throat> like, like a, um, an example, you can see there, uh, this is the, the statistics for the forums, the, usage, the forum usage, and it is clear the moment where uh, things started. Uh, well, it was a, a starting point on, on January that give us some, some of, the, of, the, of the coming problems that uh, uh, lead us to move to the current installation, but you can see that there, there was a huge uh, spike on during all the COVID and we are, have returned to, uh, to the normality. I mean, people is uh, not clearly 
urgently uh, trying to uh, reach us for information or the community for information and they are using it in the, the normally <clears throat> in a normally way uh, well the, the strengths of this uh, install so what what we like what we like of this uh, this change we have a very easy horizontal scaling procedure so we only need to use the qbctl command and uh, the, um, say how many replicas we want um, <clears throat> in the near future we're going to use the hpa the horizontal pot is autoscaler feature which will automate this scaling procedure as it on based on the usage metrics Another key point, the resource control gives us a complete uh, ready screen up when over the threshold. So uh, we're currently, this is, this is a, maybe this is a, a thing that we can improve because when, uh, for performance reasons, when we want to delete some keys on, on Redis, uh, Redis itself, just put them as available they don't uh, they are not uh, clean up from the from the memory so the memory keeps rising uh, unless you uh, prepare some deletion or some process from deletion from cleanup <clears throat> in this case we only need to restart the ready, ser the, the ready service and that's all all clean the continuous integration and deployment is almost out automated in uh, to kubernetes we still have some manual steps especially sensitive uh, the especially sensitive the latest one when when we deploy to the kubernetes cluster it needs the needs uh, this needs um, a manual uh, confirmation but we are on the way to automate them uh, the other intermediate uh, steps Except for the other steps, all the previous steps are automated so that any change in base software is integrated to the base image mutator or users and it's updated when the code is updated. So we only need to uh, update any part of this, uh, of this flow and all the internal images are recreated, uh, triggered and prepared to be deployed to production. <clears throat> Some of the changes we made can be uh, deployed without downtime. But, uh, well, we know that uh, some of these changes that involve uh, database change, database, database upgrades are not suitable to uh, do it in, without downtime, without maintenance. We need, at some point, we need to block the user's access and do we um, warranty a safe upgrade? So, uh, well, at the at final, uh, to finalize, I just want to mention a couple, couple of monitoring tools. Well, three tools, in fact, that we're using. We're using the Grafana Prometheus stack. This could give us a complete innervation of the running containers and detect possible anomalies. Also, uh, integrated with Grafana, we have Loki. Loki is a logging system, uh, they say, like Prometheus, but with logs. So uh, uh, it works extremely easy with, um, with the Kubernetes uh, installation. Uh, you only need to deploy some, some uh demon sets and then all the all the logs are being tailed and being uh, are available and in at, at certain, certain point it, they're easy to 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 log but easy to uh to control i may say the other thing that we use is the, really, the new Relic APM. It is a really, really uh, good tool 
there are similar tools also that the dog and other that we are also looking at it and open APM tools. Uh, this, this is a really useful tool to see the application from a client perspective to detect bottlenecks inside the application to uh, detect the slow, the slow transactions and debug complex requests easily. Uh, you can see uh, I put there two um, views of uh, the uh, same in, uh, in the same instant, the same problem we have. Well, it, would not, would, it wasn't a, a problem that impacted the users, but it was a problem that we detected by the anomalies. You can see there shows an increase. You can see there uh, an increase in traffic for almost 12 hours. This affected a bit the ready response. Uh, remember, we were talking in milliseconds, but it, it's significant for Redis. <clears throat> uh, this uh, affected this response time, I say, but didn't alter the overall time. The response time wasn't uh, really affected. As uh, shown the throughput traffic, graphic the traffic was almost the double but the system was able to deal with, deal with it this is uh, um, uh, easy is is difficult to think about uh, copying these uh, situations in the old install uh, well and that's all for me <laughs> so i think uh, that uh, i hope you have some useful information in this presentation and yeah. go for questions if you like. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eduard. Uh, very exciting. A lot of people always wondering how Moodle is, is running its infrastructure. So yeah. it, it was a very nice overview, very mm -hmm. inspiring. Um, looking at the questions, um, Avi, Avi is asking, uh, what custom metrics do you use for auto scaling? Uh, well, Using uh, custom metrics, uh, the metrics are uh, just the ones that uh, Kubernetes uh, shows, that is the memory usage and the CPU usage. But uh, this is uh, for, for auto scales. Mm -hmm. If we detect uh, the response time, for example, is the one that we use, but for a manually scaling. So we detect, if we detect the response time is increasing and then and this for uh, legal traffic i may say uh, so then we uh, deploy it manually so for for kubernetes it's still the version that we are running still have no no more support than than that that's, that's why we are still under under investigation this hpa the the auto scaling feature mm. yeah. I see. Okay, interesting. Um, another question from uh, Ivan. Uh, the container, how, how do you build your container images for Moodle? Do you have like uh, a special repo? Uh, we use, yeah, we use it uh, from scratch. So we have the base image. Maybe I can put uh, the slide again. We, we use uh, a basic um, uh, Ubuntu image. Mm -hmm. This image, we then in this image, we add all the needed stuff, the engines, the PHP, uh, uh, and then with this base image that we use in uh, all our sites, we put there the, the Moodle code. Uh, this code is uh, customized for every site. So we have, um, we have a special computation for Moodle.org different customizations and plugins for stats, uh, another customization for learn, mm. but the base image is the same, just uh, changing the, the, yeah, the Moodle. I must say, uh, we're not using the Vietnami container ah, images. Okay. No, uh, they are deploying the, the, the own and we are using our own. I like, I like to, I'm a bit artisan, maybe. And I <laughs> like I like to put my my things into my containers and yeah, 
and control all the things. Almost. Okay, so maybe something about this. Uh, Avi is having another have another question. Uh, why don't you put Nginx and PHP on uh, different pods? Maybe. Well, in fact, uh, I I don't think it really uh, is really worth it because. Uh, we, we can we can do it if 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 you think your workload will be necessarily but as far as they work together in so closely mm -hmm. well, well they they close they they are i think it, it's better <clears throat> that's why we use it so we have the, uh, we have different uh, if we need more engines we also will need more uh, PHP, um, PHP socket, the PHP processes. Mm -hmm. uh, then, in fact, uh, that's why we have it uh, all together. But well, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a bad idea. I mean, maybe we can look at it and see if, if we can, if we can split it. But. Uh, uh, until now, it worked great. So, cool. Okay, good, good, uh, good answer. Okay, so um, moving on, I see uh, Matir. Uh, with, are you, are you using any special custom build exporters to monitor model? Uh, not yet. That well, uh, well, uh, I must say they are not. They are these are not custom uh, because we are using uh, the. The new relic uh, approach. Uh, this is uh, maybe we can say it's an exporter. It's it's like uh, an agent we are running inside the PHP stack. So we are exporting all this information to the new relic, and and having all this information from there. So maybe it's not uh, a customization build, but it's uh, it works from this. Um, from this point as, a, as an exporter of our our runnings yeah okay so um another question from uh, martin uh, about the uh, php you know pcache uh, uh, do you use opcache preloading yeah uh, in fact uh, everything uh, all the code is pre it's pre-compiled pre -compiled. yeah uh, so if uh, you need any change there you need to restart the the php process to get the changes but well we are working on a on a container the container as i said the containers are ephemeral so if you need any change there uh, just deploy the uh, the new image and and that's all that the the usual thing it's more it's more like a problem when when the developing or in the staging side where some changes can be can be done <clears throat> but not in production production we we tend to just uh, redeploy the new image and and mm. then so being compiled is really really good. Mm. I, I know that uh, personally on my systems I frequently check the settings of application ad adapted to the load on the servers on the cluster. Mm -hmm. Do you also do that or no? In fact, no, no. Defaults, you just use the defaults. Yeah. Uh, mm. Well, the defaults. Uh, the first, I think they check the file. So uh -huh. no, we 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 are we have configured uh, configured the opcache to mm -hmm. just compile once. So it, once uh, a file is on the cache, is not uh, no more uh, check it. So yeah, no, okay. No so changes. no timestamps. You don't check for timestamps changes. No, 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 no. no, of no. That's okay. the. the that's why I say uh, we if we made a change in a PHP file, we need to restart everything. Process. Of course. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Another question. Uh, Ivan is asking about the shared storage. How do you where do you store Moodle data? We store uh, in an EFS. The EFS. Uh, the EFS. And it's good enough. Yeah. For our yeah for our situation yes it's um, there is a lot of caching there. Uh, there is a lot of um, there is a few uh, downloads or few uploads. So uh, for our for our situation, <coughs> fair enough. I I work it 
uh, earlier in I worked earlier in in the Agora project that you said before. Ah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I was working. Amazing in, project. Uh, yeah, but we, well, I missed all the all the interesting part. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I I lived uh, uh, before they they moved to Amazon. So, hmm. <clears throat> and the situation there was we were using the ANFS. Uh, uh, it worked great. And when we move here yeah, and we use it, the, the EFS, when we use EFS, it's, uh, it has a fair, a fair performance for us. So no, no, no. Okay, cool. So um, maybe last two questions, quick answers. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. How do you map uh, persistent storage? Where do you map it to? How do you map? Uh, we map the persistent storage using a persistent volume claim. Mm -hmm. I did miss it this part. Yeah, sorry, I missed this part. Uh, we map it to uh, to the to the we create a EFS part, a EFS class, yeah. EFS class manually. Uh, this is not uh, an EFS provider that give that is giving us dynamically pieces of uh, storage because we don't need it. We create the the persistent volume claim based on a persistent volume uh, using the EFS. And mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, okay. Last question: uh, the DB. Which one are you using? We use him. Uh, in this case, we use using MySQL. We have MySQL and Postgres, Postgres installations, but in this uh -huh. case, we are using MySQL. Um, uh, is not in the Kubernetes. No. We are using, no. We are using uh, some Kubernetes deployments for the demo sites. The demo sites are. All the, the stuff is on the same pot. We have a container for the application, container for the cache, and contain and a container for for the my uh, the database, and it works uh, enough. But what fair? But uh, for a huge site, I do with no. I will not recommend. And we, what would you recommend? <laughs> well, uh, Postgres maybe. Yeah, maybe process is a is a is a better thing. Especially with the locking system yeah. that David uses, uh, we have some problems with this locking in MySQL, and that wa that was why we are using the Redis the Redis locking system that Catalyst created. Yeah, and we, it's working fine. Excellent plugin. Yeah. We hope we hope to see it in Co. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, soon. Um, okay. Okay. Amazing. Thank you for the presentation and. Uh, the answers thank you, thank you um, yeah so uh, i think we'll take like uh, five to ten ten minutes break and uh, we adjourn back and um, continue with another two presentation two speakers uh, waiting to show their systems mm -hmm. we'll see what happened to uh, michael <laughs> that got lost yeah a bit yeah which has an interesting system also Mm -hmm. So uh, I leave the chat on. So if you have many questions to each other mm -hmm. or just want to discuss something. Yeah, also use, you also use the forums, the model.org forums, if you have any questions there. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we shuffled a little bit with the agenda and we changed the timing, but uh, next next is Avi, Avi Levy from um, uh, Ministry of uh, Education in uh, Israel, and then we will discuss um, um, the infrastructure, the architecture challenges and solutions uh, from the past last year, few months. So, um, Avi, let's see if I can find you, or you can just share screen. Do you have enough privileges here? Should I make you a co-host, something? Good, yeah, so I can see you can share screen. So I can hear your keyboard. But not yes. you. No, I, I'm very <laughs> silent. Yeah. 
Okay. There is a window on top of the presentation. Do, do you see it? Um, it may, yeah, this one. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. So go ahead. Okay. So uh, hi, everybody. Uh, it's uh, good to be here. Uh, my name is uh, Avi. Uh, I'm going to talk about the running model uh, at the Israeli Ministry of Education. Uh, about me, uh, my name is Avi, as I say, I'm CTO and co-founder co at uh, Sysbind, uh, which is also a, a Moodle partner is here in Israel. Uh, I'm open source developer, Google Cloud architect, Moodle partner, uh, Moodle code developer, tester, translator. I <laughs> uh, actually love, it, love the, the Moodle. Uh, if someone wants to contact me later, this is a... Uh, the details. Okay, so we run the model at, at Cluster and the Ministry of Education uh, at the last uh, five years. Uh, we also develop, uh, make a code develop in them uh, this uh, infrastructure. But then come the uh, COVID nineteen, and uh, before the first uh, uh, close of uh, uh, the, the guys from the, the Ministry of Education come with request, and the request was we want to able to take uh, uh, 10,000 uh, concurrent users, that is approximately 10,000 requ requ requests per second, at average response time of 3 seconds, and P90 of 10 seconds, and P99 of uh, 30 seconds. Uh, the infrastructure should use dedicated VMware virtualization provided by local approved provider. We cannot use any infrastructure uh, mm -hmm. that we can choose. We cannot go to the cloud. We cannot uh, uh, choose different uh, uh, providers or abilities that uh, there is and uh, the world uh, gave us. So with this requirement, we build uh, this uh, cluster. Just a second. Isn't it? You can see it. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this is uh, uh, actually the diagram of the cluster and how it works. So uh, users. It's, if it's uh, developers or uh, regular users and administrators came from the, uh, the internet, and the first thing that they see it's the uh, F5 uh, firewall with WAF uh, implementing on it, uh, and also it work as the uh, VPN for the developers. So regular users come to the F5 and see only port uh, uh, 20, uh, 18 and uh, 443 for HTTP and HTTPS. And uh, when the developers want to work with uh, this environment, so they connect with the uh, VPN to the F5. Uh, inside the cluster, uh, we have right now uh, nine web servers that used with uh, uh, NGINX and PHP FPM on it, but actually, uh, when we test it to, to uh, uh, achieve the, the requirement, we, we run uh, 18 uh, uh, web servers. This is the actual scale. Uh, this is the status right now after we understand that there is no 10,000 uh, uh, requests per second and we can scale down the cluster. But when we test and need it to, work, to be able to uh, achieve all the requirement, we, we run uh, 18 web servers. Each web server has a, a, a 60 CPU, 60 cores, and a 48 uh, giga RAM. Uh, and this is for production uh, uh, traffic. We have a uh, cron server that doesn't get the uh, user traffic and uh, uh, is uh, uh, requirement resources are a little bit uh, uh, low, 
you have a 16 CPU, uh, uh, 16 CPU and uh, 32 giga RAM, and, and it also run uh, the Blackfire agent that we used for profiling. Uh, the staging environment is actually uh, not uh, is the same scale as uh, as the production. Is there only one web server? But uh, it used for internal testing when uh, there is development or some uh, checking that we need to do, uh, upgrade for the systems. We test it on the uh, staging environment, but all the load balancer uh, traffic came only for the production web servers. Behind the, uh, the web servers, we use Redis. Uh, actually, uh, it's run uh, different uh, Redis. One for cache and one for a session. Uh, and actually, we use the PHP to connect to, to the Redis and not on, only the setting for the, uh, the Moodle, because we use the SAML authentication with external identity provider of the, of the Ministry of Education. And uh, we use the uh, uh, SAML and the uh, simple SAML PHP. And uh, the simple SAML PHP uh, was need also use the same uh, session as the Moodle used uh, to be able to uh, work without a sticky session on the load balancers uh, and uh, get to request without uh, reconnect again. For databases, we used uh, MariaDB at uh, Galera, with Galera cluster at the master master configuration. At the highest peak of the scale, we use five nodes for the production, five nodes of master master. And uh, for development, there is only one. It's, it's different cluster. Uh, all the database uh, are uh, in a different network. so. There is a firewall between the web server and the uh, uh, databases. For storage, shared storage, we used uh, Freenas. Uh, we use a Freenas server, two different Freenas server. One is for Moodle data, for uh, some configuration of uh, services like uh, the Nginx, PHP, FPM, uh, Memcache is the old one. Uh, Memcache case is not relevant yet. Uh, and another freeness only for make a backups and uh, used by the uh, Chrome that uh, run, run uh, each night and make the backups and put it over here. Uh, the development is in an internal GitLab uh, installation, community edition installation. Uh, this is where all the developers need to connect to uh, push the codes. Uh, we monitor all this environment with Zabbix, uh, external Zabbix that in uh, our Cisco in the cloud. Um, and we, we cannot monitor it directly, all this uh, uh, hosting. We use a Zabbix proxy that is actually collect all the data and uh, in turn, it uh, push the, all the uh, collected data to external uh, server that is uh, take it in, and then we can analyze it and check trending and uh, all of that. For logging, we have uh, uh, the Elastic uh, Search that also install on the same uh, uh, server. Uh, there is a different IPs from uh, traffic that came for the uh, staging and uh, traffic that came for the production. And that's it, that's uh, uh, how, how we build it. This is actually the implementation. So how we configure it, how do we configure it to, to, to be able to uh, take this scale. So we disable sticky session at first in the uh, load balancer and uh, that give us the ability to really get a, a traffic cam to each node in more uh, equal way. Uh, and uh, take advantage of all the 18 web servers that run uh, as well. Uh, we use the Moodle uh, local cache. Uh, as the Moodle uh, uh, recommended, 
and this uh, make a big improvement uh, for things that not should be shared as, uh, and you don't need to uh, make an uh, H, H, uh, TCP request and uh, just uh, take the files directly from the uh, local storage. So it's making an improvement. You don't need to go to the Redis and is it uh, really fast? Uh, we optimize the OP cache. Uh, how we optimize it, how we check it. Uh, we use the OP cache uh, model plugin actually uh, to monitor it. There is no some metrics that we check. Uh, maybe we need to add it, but uh, this is right now make it work. And the OP cache management is tool that you can install on your uh, Moodle installation and uh, uh, check the status, see if you need to change something. Actually, the OP cache is not something that changes rapidly. So uh, you need to do this uh, uh, optimizing it maybe once in uh, three, four months uh, or something really changed. New plugin that make all the, the this cluster uh, changes uh, uh, how it works. For uh, the Redis, how will we use the Redis? The Redis is actually used for PHP session storage uh, to support the SAML SSO uh, with the SAML uh, Moodle plugin and the SAML uh, PHP, uh, simple SAML PHP library. Uh, Today I can say that we we found the SAML two as a very attractive plugin that uh, make it easy to implement uh, SAML uh, with Moodle. Uh, but in this cluster, actually running uh, five to six different instances of Moodle, and uh, and they should identify by the uh, service provider by identity provider as different service provider. So each of, uh, each of them uh, need a different, uh, uh, to be a, a different service provider. And we don't want to enter to each model and update the certificate when we get certificate changed or something like that. So all the certificate are managed by the simple SAML PHP library that is shared on, over all the web uh, servers. And this is making us easy uh, work and this is the maintenance to all the SAML uh, authentication uh, uh, maintenance. So as I mentioned before, are we monitoring and logging all this environment? Uh, due to a very isolated environment, we use the uh, Zabbix monitoring with the uh, internal Zabbix proxy that collect the data inside the cluster and send it out uh, to our server uh, for the logs. We collect uh, all the logs from the instances with Fluent Bit and Fluent D, and uh, storage uh, store it at Elasticsearch server. Uh, just for the error logs, we use the Sentry uh, Sentry IO uh, servers that help us to uh, find only errors and get really get get to find them really quickly. Um, and we use the elastic only for more investigation if we cannot uh, understand what uh, we need from the sentry. Uh, for profiling analysis, we use Blackfire. A lot of time we, we, we get uh, compliant by uh, uh, the investigation. Some user says that something that work uh, very slowly, uh, uh, or if I, we see that something happened and all the cluster start to work very slow or, or, or we don't understand why. So the black fire help us to find it very key, very quickly. Uh, also when we calibrate uh, and uh, make the scale for this cluster to, to be what it is today, the black fire was uh, a, good, a good tool in our uh, toolbox to make it quickly. For the load testing, we use the uh, K6 cloud, but K6, it's also an open, uh, open source project that you can uh, run it on your computer, uh, uh, make a, a scenario test. Uh, but for the disk scale, we cannot run it from uh, uh, our servers and, and we want to see 
to get all the ability that it's came from this, the, the cloud the, the solution. So we use it to actually uh, run a real 10,000 uh, concurrent users. Uh, it's come from a different uh, uh, regions of from different zones and it start uh, together and all the traffic came to this cluster. And this is how we actually check that we get this request uh, uh, done, complete. For the user experience, we use uh, Google uh, Analytics. Uh, and this is close all the uh, monitoring and logging from the user until the uh, infrastructure. Management tools, how we manage this cluster. So to manage this cluster, we use a lot of bash script for automation. Uh, we use Ansible to deployment and configura configuration management. And we still have some configuration that is on the NFS, as I showed you before. But uh, uh, as we uh, as we go, we start to convert uh, configuration to be managed only by the Ansible and not on uh, NFS. Uh, the reason was when we upgrade the system at the end of each year, we upgrade all the system, we we, we make a changes, uh, we decide to which kind of each service or of each version to go. So when we do some upgrades, like say YAM install, uh, because the uh, configuration is on an NFS, the RPM is right on the NFS. And if servers are still not uh, ready to get this RPM, this makes some problem. So uh, Danceable is a good, uh, good solution for that. We use the MUSH to update the uh, uh, configuration on the instances or the, on these clusters. Okay, if you want to change some HTTP only check, okay, or, or you want to see any, any changes in the database, if you had a lot of instances that run on this cluster. So this is the easy way to, to manage configuration. And uh, for, uh, for alerting from the uh, system, the Zabbix, we use Zabbix scripts that we can configure. Let's say we, we see, we get alert, PHP, FPM, it's not running. So we have actually tell the team, try to make a, a, a system CTL, restart PHP, FPM, if it not work twice, send uh, send me a notification and, and I will uh, respond to it. But it try to make it automatically before it send the notification. What the issues actually to we have with this uh, type of cluster? So in in the last two years, the uh, and especially. Uh, with the COVID-19, the amount of uh, courses that actually created in, in each uh, year are, are very large. We have a, a 50K uh, courses that run right now on, on the production uh, uh, instance, and we need to make it backuply every night. Actually, we, are, we set the, the, the backups not to make a backup to courses that are not uh, changes and make it optimized, but still right now we cannot finish backup all the courses in 24 hours. Uh, so we cannot actually make it a daily backup if you want to do it, a daily course backup. Um, we use a lot of resources, just wait for peaks. Uh, as we start, the, the, the start request from the Ministry of Education was to 10,000 requests per second, but we found it's not, actually, we don't get half of this. So uh, when you use uh, uh, virtual machines uh, and when you cannot control it or use rules and make it automatically rules or work with APIs to manage this uh, infrastructure. So we actually, buy all the infrastructure, make payment of infrastructure, use it, actually take it, but not use it. Uh, and this is one of the problem. Uh, 
as I'm saying, no infrastructure API for auto provisioning and auto scale. If you understand that you want to scale something or you want to change something, you cannot connect directly to the infrastructure. Uh, MariaDB Galera in Master Master, when we using five nodes, it was almost, uh, I call it not work, okay? It's not something that you want in production. It was a crash weekly basis and uh, uh, we decided to scale down to three nodes. Uh, two of the nodes, I forgot to say when I saw, show you the, uh, the, the schema, but two of the nodes are used for uh, web servers and one node uh, don't get request uh, queries from the web servers, it used only for the cron uh, and uh, we take from we take the same node used for uh, uh, DB backups that make it nice. Uh, this actually work. It's work. Three nodes are work. Still, if I compare it to other uh, installation that we have with uh, uh, of Moodle, and um, if someone will ask me to recommend about uh, this uh, uh, configuration, I will not. Uh, but this is how it work right now, but it's not enough steady as I want to production uh, installation. But it can, it can take heavily uh, traffic and, and very, very large. The, the, this cluster are 32 core for each node and 128 giga RAM for each node. So it's actually a big, big DB cl resource cluster. Uh, and the, the most uh, of the issues required IT attention and uh, connection to the system and take an action. You cannot automatically everything. And you need the things that not actually take care for themselves as uh, Eduardo uh, say uh, in his presentation before with the self feeling uh, and we have single point of failure in NFS and in the Redis. And if one of them take that go down, all the system will go down. So this is the issue of this configuration. What are our solutions? Uh, our solution is to migrate to cloud provider and uh, give more programmable and fast control of, of infrastructure. Uh, use the Kubernetes uh, as the container orchestration. Uh, when you separate all service uh, and you take the approach of microservice, you take uh, control on each of the elements that you run in this cluster. And if one of them have a problem, you can just take care of it. Let's say if you have a problem in, in Uniconv, it's not affect the web server. It's affect only Uniconv. The same as... Uh, uh, on the analysis of the uh, 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 Moodle analysis. Uh, uh, also, uh, for if you have solar, you just install it outside and you can make the search uh, not on the same uh, uh, service, not on the same web, web servers that run. Uh, so the, the Kubernetes and the container and microservices approach is the good solution for us. Uh, use auto scale and uh, self filling by use the uh, custom metrics and health checks. Uh, you can get more accurate scale, uh, and you can uh, actually work on each one of the services and make a testing for it. Uh, each testing that everybody everybody is is over here in this uh, uh, meeting actually know it's CPU memory. Uh, and storage, but you can also start to check if if uh, the response time, if how much time it take to to DB uh, service to answer, or only for NGNX, how much connection I have on the NGNX, uh, how much time it take to answer, and just scale the relevant service, and if this service is not healthy, the Kubernetes will try to make it healthy, try to restart it or, or uh, scale it without any intervention of uh, uh, 
the ITs. The ITs guys, uh, and it's make it very easily to control a large scale implementation with a few uh, uh, resource human, uh, human resource needed. Use PostgreSQL uh, in master slave in the ratio for one to two uh, with auto failure. Uh, as we see in the DB monitoring, uh, the Moodle show was a one to 10 ratio for write and read. Uh, so you, you can simplify the, the DB cluster, uh, not work with master master, work just with master slave. And as we know uh, from pre Moodle 3.9, we also can configure uh, uh, read write hosting for the, the, the database. Uh, so we actually have, don't need to implement a, a SQL uh, balancer in the middle uh, and, and avoid the master master, the post, post SQL. Uh, you can see uh, it's, there is a, a, a over here and also there is just put the, the wrong link, but also there is a, a catalyst uh, uh, write the uh, uh, post on the Moodle site. Uh, as, then, as mentioned before, there is a lock in and at scale they see a, a, lot, of, a lot of improvement of post -VS SQL. Also the stability of it. Uh, I can say that instances that we work with Postgres uh, work and commonly not crash. And then the MariaDB we need to give the attention. Um, use Redis cluster, eliminate the Redis single point of failure. And uh, for sure storage, we still look for the right solution. We try different things, but we don't have the optimal uh, uh, way for, for, we just uh, still try to figure it. That's it uh, guys. Uh, uh questions thank thank you avi that was uh, very enlightening very exciting uh, presentation I, I i know most of it so um <laughs> i don't have <laughs> much questions but uh, because we already discussed it so many times but maybe somebody yes. else has uh, has questions um Maybe, you know what, maybe you tell a little bit about the upgrades, because I think this is a challenge everybody is experiencing. Um, I think yes. this is a 3.8 uh, model, and also you have uh, a lot of instances, not just one system and several systems. So what, what are the challenges? Yes. Upgrading? So in, in this case, Yes, the challenges actually is uh, how to uh, deploy a lot of uh, rapidly work. Uh, how you how do you upgrade uh, the infrastructure? How you upgrade services that need because the application need them uh, require require you to upgrade the MariaDB servers or anything of that. So. We shared the, I just tried to go back. Where is the back options over here? I think it's here. Okay. So, as I say, we have a shared, in, shared storage uh, for ETC. For NGINX, for uh, PHP FPM. So when I make change in one web server, it's make the change for everything, for all of them. Also, the code is sit on the uh, NFS and the Moodle data also on the NFS. So we write a script that uh, we make a Git pool and uh, we run on every instance and make a Git pool for the code. So when I uh, make the git pull on one web server, actually it's updated on all of the eight, nine on 18, that it was. Uh, and, and also run the 
from the cron. I can do it also from the cron and run the PHP uh, upgrade, uh, PHP CLI of Moodle to make the upgrade. Uh, so this is actually how we upgrade the code of Moodle. Uh, if you need to install something new. Uh, is it, fast enough? Are... is it fast enough to be stored on the shelf? I, I can say for sure that it's not the same as put it on the local disk. And we saw it uh, uh, in our implementation of Moodle on, on uh, Kubernetes that the code sit with the pod. Or, or actually, if you see, put it on the same uh, local storage, it's much more quickly. We can see it also uh, in the uh, analysis of the uh, Blackfire. Uh, you can see that the, the time is improved. Yeah. Uh, but so OP cache helps a lot. OP cache helps helps a lot in this uh, in this case. But if you reset it or uh, change something, uh, yeah, it, it costed the first. You actually. Uh, if there is something new in the PHP or you change something, you, you, the first you, you will see that it's working a little bit slower. But uh, in the in the meantime, it's 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 work okay, but but not as the same as uh, if the code sit on the on the local storage. But it's local storage; it's it's more complicated to manage and deploy all this code. Uh, at the same time, you need that all the users do not uh, uh, affect from your deploy a new a new uh, plugin or a new fixes. You just need do it once, and all the traffic for all web servers, no matter which session are actually work, will not affect from it. So this gives us this ability. Um, and I think this is why the, the code also sit on the NFS. Uh, for upgrading and managing all the uh, services and uh, OS systems, we use the Ansible with playbooks. We run uh, uh, playbooks for upgrading uh, uh, and rapidly for security only. And uh, at the end of the year, we actually upgrade the versions of, uh, of services that run. Uh, upgrade the, the, the OS systems, upgrade PHP if we need, uh, all, that, uh, all the services that actually run on the system. Um, okay. Good. So thank, thank you very much. Anybody has any other questions? I uh, didn't see anything in the chat, so. Okay, so I just want to say uh, that it's, uh, I think that uh, to, to hear that Moodle HQ is going to start to work on in Kubernetes, it's, uh, it's make me very glad uh, not to be <laughs> very lonely on this, uh, and, uh, to know that it's also the approach of Moodle. I yeah. also recommend it to each of, the, each of you guys, start to work with the, the, the the Kubernetes, the containers on Minikube on your laptop, feel very uh, comfortable with this. You find it's very easily and very free. It's free. It's free your time to do much more things that are better than just uh, maintenance your cluster and take it to the next level. Uh, and I hope that uh, this community will be uh, of microservices, running model of microservices and Kubernetes will grow. Uh, and uh, I am happy to be part of this community and the uh, model partner. That's all, thanks. Okay, so you see, this is the future as far as you can see it. Uh, yes, I, I'm very glad to see that model already uh, work, uh, model HQ already work yeah. like this and uh, uh, this is the way. So, I think this is the future. The, this is the future of the infrastructure, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, when you can separate to microservices to manage it, not for the application, but for the infrastructure, it's free you from manage the, the the virtual machine. You know, it's like we was in the uh, uh, 
buying a, a, a bare metal and deploy web servers on them, bare metal and then comes the virtual machines. I think we are in the way that come the containers and then come the container orchestrations. We are in this place and this is the future as I, as I see it. And, and do you think Moodle is uh, having uh, the right infrastructure for this? Do you think we should have something? I don't, I, don't, I don't know if, if the application as is built can serve it very well as, as if you build it from scratch. If you build Moodle today from scratch, you may be separate, maybe the plugin to be as a, 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 a microservice and not should be part of the Moodle core. I can just drop another pod with a plugin and use it as a microservice with REST API. But <laughs> it's far from there. The model run on microservices very well. We can run it. We have a solution that we run Moodle as a service and it's built all of it on microservices, on Kubernetes. And, and, and it's worked. I can say it in production, it's worked. It's worked very well and, and give us the, the freedom to, to do crazy things. Uh, scale automatically to, to traffic uh, uh, without uh, concern if we have the nodes, if we don't have resources, just scale the nodes. The, the, the only risk, the only things that you need to think about it is to put the limits to not pay too much if you want <laughs> for the scales. Uh, uh, but, but it's very, very easily to scale. This is what this gives you, the ability to scale without make... Uh, uh, in this scale, we take the model to uh, take it down for one week, just for calibrate it to this scale. It's take us one week that the model was down and we just and uh, make a, a, a load testing and calibrate it and scale it until we get it. Uh, but with the microservices and uh, the Kubernetes, you can, and the cloud actually, uh, without the cloud, you cannot do it. Um, Moodle, Moodle is way. about uh, to, uh, I don't know, share a new service that you can uh, install plugins uh, remotely via, LTI, so mm -hmm. they are not actually on your system. This is something, it's a little bit cloudy. We, we don't know what's the exact technology and infrastructure behind this, but maybe you see something of a mix between this new idea it's, that will be coming. Uh, it can be start. I also don't know, also as a partner, how, how actually technology the, the technology behind it's going to be work. Actually, you just enroll to another service that run some, someone, someone else. I, I talk about actually use every uh, optional. Let's say we have the uh, uh, model added the, uh, the ability to make a prediction, to make analysis. Uh -huh. uh, uh, so you just create a service in, in, in that not actually connect to the model and implement it, it's run outside. Yeah. Uh, and this is how it's worked actually, the, the model analytics. Uh, uh, also, if you have a stack, you need to make a, a calculation for uh, mathematics. You create another service and you can scale it if you need it and not scale it if you don't need it. You mean the you stack make... question type? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so all of this, all, also the, the Unoconf, uh, uh, we run it on, on a different service. It's not in the same pod. Uh, this is help us to figure out a lot of uh, issues uh, and scale only that only what we need. If scale only the PHP FPM, only the NGNX. Uh, the most bigger, biggest problem that we have right now is the databases, managed databases on this infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, but we work on it, and, uh, uh, but it's not easy to scale it automatically. Um, this okay. is the only thing that we, we, 
we have an issue with it today. And we're glad to, if someone uh, just uh, jump up to the party. <laughs> join the party. You <laughs> can join the party. Yeah. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, Avi, again, and um, for those insights. Um, we are moving uh, forward the agenda, and uh, next, next is um, uh, Michael. Um, Michael from uh, Carnet, the Carnet Enren, um, which is in Croatia. Uh, Michael, are, are you ready with your uh, presentations? Are you with us online? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. Thank you. Okay. Um, do you want me to share my screen? Please. Uh, Please try. Maybe I need to give you some co hosting permissions. Okay. No, you're, you're okay. You okay? Can you can you see it? Yeah, I can see it and we hear you clearly. Thank you. Okay. Please go okay. ahead. Okay. Uh, hi everyone. My name is Michael. I come from uh, Croatia. I'm an employee of Carnet. Carnet is a um, Croatian academic and research network, uh, part of NREN. Um, Apart from uh, running Moodle, we are a TLD registry operator. We offer broad palette of uh, various infrastructure and network services for the education sector. Uh, we are primarily a Debian-based um, organization. Um, uh, same as everyone, when uh, COVID-19 uh, happened and the lockdown and everything, uh, online school uh, exploded, and so did our model. Um, we had one server uh, with uh, HProxy, Apache, PHP, and Memcached. Um, we were looking around 800 sometimes uh, concurrent users. And um, at one day, we saw over 2,000, 3,000 users, and uh, we decided it's time to uh, scale it up. So um, for the first step, we decided to um, scale it down to three web servers. We used uh, one um, SQL server, uh, external uh, caching server, and external data server. Uh, and uh, back in the September of 2020, we scaled it up a little bit more. This is the current situation on our Moodle infrastructure. So we have uh, six web servers. We have a three database server uh, with um, Galera. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the newest uh, MariaDB. Uh, we are using an external cache server with uh, KeyDB, uh, which is a drop-in replacement for Redis. Uh, we started to um, see some problems with our initial Redis instance because it uh, maxed out on a CPU uh, and we started to look in other various solutions. And when then we decided to transfer to KeyDB. KeyDB is a um, uh, multi-core Redis, and it works just fine. Interesting. Um, yeah, uh, we switched in September. Uh, I remember in a Telegram group, I asked around, and I remember Martin wrote that they will probably try it. Um, so we did it before. <laughs> you got into <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, so no. so this is the current situation on our model. Uh, we are uh, running everything in the uh, VMs. Uh, Debian Buster is uh, the OS for each and every one of these instance. We have F5 as a load balancer uh, in front. Um, we we are using for for the local cache on web servers. We have uh, uh, flash drives and SSD drives. So in case uh, the flash uh, is let's say it breaks down, other three web servers 
which are on SSD, they will continue to work. So, so we don't have a single point of failure on the hardware side. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have the same uh, situation on the SQL. We have uh, two SQLs on flash drives and, and another one on SSDs. Uh, our uh, data is on the NFS. Uh, we have uh, three. Uh, we have four tiers of disks, and uh, now we are on the uh, faster than the slowest one for the Moodle data. We uh, saw some performance issues when doing backup. We have a very high input output on the read, and so we decided to transfer the data on the fast ones. 15k disks. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so the uh, the new architecture lies on the uh, Nginx and the uh, PHP FPM. Uh, the hypervisor yeah. above it's it's uh, Proxmox. It's KVM based. And that's about it. Uh, we are doing, uh, we also have uh, another two instances, uh, which we, um, which are the, they are using a similar setup, but um, they are a, like a single server. Mm -hmm. They are also Nginx, uh, PHP, FPM. Uh, they have a external database. And that's it. Uh, when the uh, when we upgraded Moodle, our initial version was three point six, and uh, back in uh, September we upgraded it to three point nine, and we are using uh, the newest Moodle feature, uh, splitting reads and writes across the servers. So two of our web servers, they are using SQL1, as you can see on the picture, they are using SQL1 as the uh, read. Mm -hmm. Other two, they are using SQL2, and the other two using SQL3. And all of them are writing to a single server, to SQL1. Um, yeah, um, yeah how does I it work for you? Uh, it, it works just fine. Um, mm -hmm. I, I remember... Uh, when the pandemic started, uh, we also reached out to other neurons. I remember talking to you, to Martin, yeah. and I remember all, all of your uh, other, all of your uh, architecture. I remember you used um, two web servers. Uh, uh, they were writing to one database mm -hmm. instance, other two. Uh, so we decided something similar, but we just wanted to be sure because we have a lot of uh, plugins, uh, we just want to be sure that there, there will be no locking on uh -huh. the table. So we are just writing to one server. Uh, be, because when we did an insight on the uh, system, uh, almost 80% of the uh, was reads, Re read intensive. Yeah. Um, okay. I'll just move the slide. Uh, for monitoring, we are using a variety of different Nagios checks. Mm -hmm. um, for the uh, insight, we are using uh, Prometheus and Grafana, the same as everybody else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, combination. Yeah, combination. Um, so here you can see on the picture, uh, this is a simple node exporter. Uh, the, the exporters we are using are primarily for uh, PHP, FPM. Uh, one, uh, this is actually for Redis, but it works on the key DB mm. because, it's, of course, it's a drop-in replacement for, for Redis. Uh, we have an Nginx exporter and MySQL exporter. And this is a comparison before and after the uh, pandemic started. Um, after the, after our um, 
reconfiguration of our system we um, we could handle four to five thousand simultaneously uh, concurrent users because um, we have um, a different variety of courses and quizzes so it's a all-around system um, and this works just fine okay we can skip this um, and this kind of setup works just fine for us but um, we are planning to do the migration on the OpenStack and Ceph and we are also looking into a container-based uh, Moodle. And that's why uh, presentation today from the Moodle HQ was very interesting and I hope to see some more information on it. Um, we are, we are uh, on-prem company. We have uh, our own data centers um, and we have just recently acquired some new hardware and then we are of course migrating everything on OpenStack and Ceph, so the Moodle, uh, container-based Moodle, would be <laughs> very good for us. Yeah. Mm. And um, that's about it. Okay. Uh, because yeah. uh, the, we, we saw today a different variety of uh, presentations, um, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we can see that uh, each and every one of us, we are using similar setups in the cloud and on-prem so this is actually nothing exactly. new from yeah yeah it's, it's amazing so um i think one of the things that many you, you can see in many presentations that people are either trying containers or, or about to try and eventually consider very much moving in this direction and uh, maybe we should uh, communicate this to, to Moodle. Obviously they use it, but uh, I actually wonder if they also use it in the Moodle cloud, which is maybe run by the partners and not, not by Moodle itself, I'm not sure. Uh, so I wonder what's the infrastructure for that, the moodlecloud.com, not, not the Moodle org that we saw today. Um, yeah. Uh also, for the backup, uh, we are using external server, which is uh, dumping everything on the tape. We also experience the same problems as uh, Avi. Uh, the 24 hours is just not enough to do the backup of the courses. Uh, I think we have around 14,000 courses. Um, and uh, the latest Moodle versions, you can uh, parallelize, uh, parallel. Um, the, the the backup process the the tasking the schedule task the ad hoc task so you can have um, many uh, backup runnings at the same time uh, yes, what version are you using what uh, three uh, 3.9 oh, okay so i think we have we have this in 3.9 already uh, yeah, but uh, the issue for us, it's still uh, input output of our disks uh, oh, for the Moodle yeah. data. And uh, when it starts, it just kills the server. I mean, uh, that's why we, we run it uh, gradually uh, over the month. You have big courses? Like uh, yes, yes. Okay. And how do you... I, have, I, have, I, have, I have seen a course, I mean, 17 gigabytes. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Do you use some kind of uh, video service to handle all uh, the yes. videos? Yes, uh, we have a big blue button uh, instance. Ah, okay. This is for synchronous sessions, but how about streaming vi video, like uh, VODs, video on demand? Uh, uh, I don't know, actually. For recording. Uh, yeah. Uh, because I am uh, just a system administrator. <laughs> I'm not a Moodle administrator. We have our own team which administers the Moodle. I just do the things un underneath the underneath everything. I just do yeah. the systems, uh, uh, 
Moodle upgrades together with my colleagues. I see. So the infrastructure, of course. Yeah. Um, okay. So another question I have in mind, um, what about security? How do you handle security for the whole um, infrastructure? Do you have uh, some, um, some kind of uh, WAF uh, firewall or? Uh, we have, um, for DDoS, we have a, a real array that's a device for DDoS mm -hmm. attacks. Uh, and uh, F5, of course, yeah. we have some we have some uh, rules on the F5, and uh, regarding uh, on the security uh, on the inside uh, on the servers, uh, I use IP tables. Okay. And uh, for the deployment and administration of the web servers and SQLs, of course, we use Ansible. Mm -hmm. I have some plays in play. Yeah same as everybody else of course okay thank you very much thank you very much um, Michael. um so thank you. yeah so th this was the the last uh, uh, presentation i didn't get uh, to find uh, um, Michael from the united states i don't that was on the agenda but maybe we'll get him on a different recording and share it with everyone else um, can you, I'm taking the sharing off. So I want to just uh, wrap things up and, and maybe open the, the stage for some discussion. If, if anybody have any interesting issues that you would like to ask everybody else or, or raise some point and see what uh, other people's opinion about it. And remind everybody that, um, let, let's see, okay, not sharing the wrong, the right screen. Um, there is um, this Moodle, where is it? Admin, this one, yeah. The, this is the Telegram, Telegram um, channel for um, our, specific interest which is running large scale models with, and everybody interested should uh, join in this is running in parallel to the uh, beautiful and very informative uh, Moodle forums uh, on moodle.org and I regularly um, because of the type of this um, uh, channel I regularly take all the data of the discussion and either put it in the right place in the wiki, the Moodle wiki, or, or just have a history log of all the discussion if, if you're not a, a Telegram user. So this is one way to get into this. Um, and, and back to the question I had, do anybody of you, does anybody of you um, have any issue you would like to uh, raise this, uh, in this community, in this, maybe a question to any of the presenters that are still with us. Okay. Tim, maybe you are interested in saying, asking something? Um, no. <laughs> Not particularly. I just thought I'd turn my video on and say goodbye. Ah, cool. Thank you. Thank you for being with us, for joining the session. Mm. Perhaps so what I could say to you is thank you very much for putting this morning together. It's been very helpful, I think, to see. Well, others have said, in some ways, there's a range of approaches, and in other ways, kind of scaling Moodle is not rocket science. You just kind of need you need all the bits, you need the right caches, you need the right database, you need the right web servers, you need enough of each. Uh, so you need good monitoring, so you can tell if you've got enough of each, um, or if you know, see problems coming before you run out of capacity. Mm -hmm. And really that's that's been the way for years. You know, you, All of us, I expect with time, and particularly in the last year, our traffic has grown. So for many of us, we weren't starting from nothing. We had a sit, 
we had a system that could cope with this much traffic. Traffic started going up, so we had to find the bottlenecks and fix it and kind of rinse and repeat forever. And somehow yeah. Moodle keeps exactly. working. But thank you for putting this together. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs> my pleasure. Thank you very much. So thank you, everybody. Uh, I will stop the recording and uh, probably it will take me uh, a few, few days uh, to splice everything uh, down and get the presentations up. And uh, I will send you an email when everything is ready so you can go back to this and enjoy it. And even people who didn't join us today but still registered might be interesting. Um, see you all in the Telegram channels and the other media outlets out there. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all the speakers. <laughs> Very impressive. Thank you no for sharing. Goodbye. Thanks. Be in touch. Yeah, be in touch. Goodbye, everybody. All right. Thanks. Thanks and bye. You're welcome. Thank you.